I was a very privileged child of color. My parents were educated. We lived in a middle class neighborhood in Birmingham. Uh, all of the neighbors were like parents. We were church going all the time. And um, things were good as far as our neighborhood was concerned, as that community was concerned. However, it was very clear that we were at, uh, in a disadvantaged position. It was very clear that we were getting hand-me-down books at points from the white schools. It was clear I couldn't go into the bathroom, into the restroom downtown, that when I went downtown there was no one in a position of power, no one of color in a position of power. Everyone was white, police officers, firemen, even the people behind the cash registers. And so you had this black community that was very nurturing with its own black stores and black physician and black attorney. And you go downtown and everything, all power, was in the hands of whites. And so there was no conversation between the two groups. And most important, children knew, children of color were well aware we were considered second class. We could not go to Kittyland, the place where you could go and ride the Ferris wheel. We could see where the white children could go. And it was very, very discouraging. And we would ask, why? Why could we not go? Why were we not considered good enough? My parents had me very involved with them in the Alabama Christian movement. Uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth was leading it. And so I was to go regularly to church. And I enjoyed some of the church on Sunday and fellowship and singing in the choir, even without a voice and all of that. But uh, in the middle of the week, I really didn't want to go. I wanted to stay home and do my math because that's what I loved, doing math. And my parents would placate me by allowing me to sit in the back of the church, eat my M&Ms, and do my math. And I'll never forget uh, listening but doing the math and hearing a man say, if the children participate in this demonstration, in this peaceful demonstration, even no, if the children participate in this demonstration, all of America will see that even children understand the difference between right and wrong and that children want the best possible education. And I looked up and I said, who is that man? And of course, it was Dr. King. And so when we went home, I said to my parents, I was thinking about it the whole time, I said, I want to go. I have to do this because I wanted the best possible education. I loved learning. I enjoyed school. I loved to read, and I was fascinated by mathematics. And I wanted to see why people thought white children were smarter than I was. And so, because to me, smart meant fascination with ideas and a willingness to work really hard. And I didn't think anybody could work any harder than I could. And so I said, I've got to go. And they said, absolutely not. And I was very upset. And I said to them, then you guys are hypocrites. You told me to go and listen to the minister. I did. I want to do what he suggested. And you're saying no. Well, at that time, you did not say that to your parents. So my father said very calmly, go to your room. And the next morning they came in, and it was a very powerful statement. They sat on both sides of my bed. It was frightening because I could tell they had been crying. I'd never seen my parents cry. And they said they had been praying all night. And they said this to me, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We simply didn't know who would be responsible for you and how you'd be treated if you were placed in jail. And so they thought about it and they said, but we have decided to leave it in God's hands. And if you want to go, you can. And that's why I went. This was risky business, not knowing what was going to happen to children, not knowing how they were being treated, and with, with many teachers feeling, you know, that the children need to be in school. And, and so it was not a cut, right or wrong approach. There were a number of people within that movement who had different points of view about that. And yet they were trying to do something that was different. They had tried other things. Nothing seemed to get the attention of the nation. But we know in America people care about children, ultimately. So it turned out that the strategy was absolutely effective. It was absolutely brilliant, but it was risky. But when thinking about social justice, typically there is some risk involved. We were trained to be as disciplined as possible. 
to learn to march and not to be affected by the statements made by police as we went by and because they were working to upset us and because if we were upset and threw a rock then it would make sense they would protect themselves and that was the point that we were really being taught to march to sing and to keep moving we were taught these songs and they were from the spirituals so when you woke up this morning with my mind we've always been singing set on Jesus and then it's set on freedom you see and so you're singing a song and you're thinking about both you're thinking about what people have gone through in the name of what's right anyway and amazingly I think all of the lessons we've been taught when you think about David going up against Goliath you see, uh, all of that came together for us. These are children who had been in Sunday school and the Baptist training unit, you know, and youth fellowship and where adults have been talking about lessons of what's important and what courage means. And I think all of that came together. And most important, when I think about it, we knew that our families and our church, all of our churches were behind us. So it was that sense of community in a strong faith-based environment that led us that way. It was a special lesson for me about the power of community, about being taught to be disciplined, about knowing how to listen to instructions, to focus and to take everything else from the outside and focus on your goal. And most important, about having a sense of purpose that we were doing this not just for ourselves, but for some higher purpose, a purpose that it, it focused on civil rights for all Americans. When we got up to City Hall, we got to, to the steps, and I, I was, and there was the police commissioner. There was Bull Connor, and I was so afraid. And he said, what do you want, little Negro? Oh, and I mustered up the courage, and I looked up at him, and I said, Sir, the southern word for sir, we want to kneel and pray for our freedom. That's all I said. That's all we wanted to do. I was to pray and pray for our freedom to go to, be able to go to the best schools and to have all the rights that Americans are supposed to have. It was just that simple. But as you know, because there was no permit for us to participate, to have a peaceful demonstration, we had, they had the right to put us in jail, and he did pick me up, and he did, and he did spit in my face. He really did. He was so angry. He was so angry, and uh, because the light was shining on his city. You know, I've thought about it a lot since then. At that time, I was a child, and it was just awful. And, but he did throw us in, threw me in, and people got others in, and we went off. And it was so frightening to be encaged, and we were there for a week. For a week. For a week, five days. We hadn't done anything that was wrong. We were just innocent little kids. And there we were put in with the bad boys who were to beat us up. And it was not a pretty picture. And I always tell the story that there were some Bibles in the, in there. And I would to, to get my I would have my kids sing songs. And I would sometimes read and have them repeat after me. And this is, it was just amazing. The Lord is my shepherd, the kids say. The Lord is my shepherd. And sometimes when the bad kids would come over and try to get one of my kids, I'd start reading, right? And my little kids would say it, and it would always scare, it would frighten the, the bad boys away. <laughs> so I always said the Lord was protecting me. I was constantly, I was, I was, I was reading to them regularly. And, um, and even at night when I couldn't see, I just knew scripture. I would say it, and the little kids would say it. When I think about it, I get tears. That they were scared, and but we would say that scripture, and it would strengthen us. It would fortify us. When we got out, uh, within a short period, the school board suspended us from school. And Mr. Bell, our principal, one of my heroes, who also is the uncle of Mrs. Colin Powell, Alma Vivian Powell. Uh, Mr. Bell, a mathematician, somebody who, who literally influenced my movement towards mathematics because of his excitement about math, had to put us out of school, had, and he didn't want to. 
but he had no choice. And it was a brilliant example of leadership. Mr. Bell decided to have an assembly. Rather than have us moving out in shame and embarrassment, he called an assembly, the kind one called for the National Honor Society. It was absolutely brilliant. And we were all almost embarrassed because we didn't know what he was going to do. And he used the format of the National Honor Society, which involved calling each person to be inducted as a call of honor, the person to walk up to the stage. He did that for each of us. And when we all were there, he talked. And later on, I realized he had used themes from Thoreau's Civil Disobedience. Never forget it. And then, and he had tears. He didn't want to do it. It was so amazing. And they gave us a standing ovation. It was a powerful moment. It just was. It was just an amazing moment of leadership. I'll never forget that. That sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do, but it's how you do them. It's the authenticity with which one acts that determines how that act is interpreted. And we got the point that he was proud of us. It was very special. And he did one more thing. He arranged for all of us to, be get, to get the homework, to have someone send the homework home and to work with us even while we were out of school. So that was one very special experience. And then I learned about the court system when the federal judge finally said, put those children back in school. We were all in church waiting for the decision. Again, we just all cried because we thought we would have lost a year of school. It was an awful experience. It really was. There's several things I think about. First of all, I learned a lot about redemption myself. When Bull Connor died, and I've, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, my mother called me, and she was crying. And I said, Mama, why are you crying? He was awful to me. And she said something that changed my life. She, she couldn't talk at first. And then she said, because he was somebody's child. He was somebody's child. Whoever he was, he learned from his parents. He did the best he could. And before I knew it, without wanting to, I was crying. <laughs> But it was wonderful because I released all of that resentment and I got her point. I got her point. 